Yeah, this is pretty interesting. The new feature in Zoom that lets you know when the recording's in progress and it lets you know when in. That's kind of, kind of interesting. At least you kind of know. And that's a good cue because sometimes if you're, we've, I've recorded podcasts before when people have forgotten to record. There was one podcast that actually we did. It was for another company. It was kind of before me and a couple other friends started a podcast and we were recording one night and it was actually for one of the friends companies webinar or whatever and we went recorded and went through 30 minutes 45 minutes of talk and then realized we didn't record this so we had to go back and record again <laughs> oh yeah so it's not seeing links or so maybe you want to share the links within within the zoom chat it should probably be okay there so so welcome everyone thanks for for joining today I'm Philip Wiley, and this is Poning Web Apps, an introduction to web app pen testing. So yeah, Lola, if you want to post links, just pop them up in, in chat. We'll be fine in the, the uh, chat window for Zoom. I don't think it blocks URLs. I don't think, I don't think, I don't have my Zoom account set up to block it anyway. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I have my OSCP, CISSP, and SANS web app pen testing certification. I'm an offensive cybersecurity professional instructor, so I do pen testing as well as teach uh, pen testing. Been full time teaching for since since like September and doing pen testing on the side, but getting ready to flip that and do go more in, back into to pen testing again. The teaching will be more on the side. Uh, I'm also adjunct professor at Dallas College. This is where I got my my teaching experience in January of 2018, I started uh, teaching the ethical hacking class there at Dallas College, which is formerly Rich Richland College. It was part of the Dallas Cali uh, College District, and they decided to go to one college name, which kind of makes so sense, and then just use the campus names for each location. So that's where I got my start and really got interested. I was doing mentoring before I started teaching and I thought teaching might be a good opportunity. My wife was taking a digital forensics course at uh, Dallas College. And just for Don's information, uh, Jason, our, our coworker, was actually her instructor there. And that's how I found out about the job. So my wife told him when they said they were going to start a ethical hacking class, if they could find an instructor. My wife says, hey, my, my husband's a pen tester. And Jason said, have him send me his resume. And so I sent him, his res sent him my resume and probably less than five or 10 minutes later, he responded back, wow, I want to work with you because they're really big on wanting to hire instructors there that have industry experience, not just someone that teaches the course and not to say there's anything wrong with that, but they prefer to have industry professionals that worked in the field so you can share those experiences with students. And that's sometimes that's an, that's an important piece, sharing the experiences because one of the things the workshops I do and talks I do, people that aren't in pen testing want to get into it, they find that, that information helpful. So that's really kind of guided a lot of things I do. So I founded the Pwn School Project. So that's kind of when I do my work, free conference workshops, it's based on uh, the Pwn School name. So this one, for instance, Poning Web Apps. So the Pwn School Project, I founded that back in June of 2018. Some of my students at Dallas College wanted further education, but didn't have the money for like SANS, SANS courses and that sort of thing. And they wanted to know what to do to learn next. And so I decided to start Pwn School. So Pwn School started, was founded in June and the first meeting was in July uh, in Dallas, Texas. And then I added a second meeting in Denton, Texas in August. So we've been going strong since 2018. Haven't missed a month. Uh, prior to the pandemic, the month, actually the year before I started uh, streaming my, my courses at Dallas College. And so uh, since I was streaming that, I decided to go ahead and start streaming the Pwn School meetings in Dallas. So when the pandemic hit, actually one month before, the, before things started getting locked down in Dallas, the venue that I used, this restaurant had closed down. And so we had to go... 100% remote that month, which I believe was actually in a, on a February. So then March, we went ahead and kept going completely virtual. 
So we still haven't started up in person yet, but we plan on doing it. When that happens, I'll still stream the Dallas meetings. We may not be streaming both meetings at that point. We may be sticking to just the one meeting streamed because when you have to carry equipment to venues to to stream, it can be kind of a kind of a pain. But also at Pwn School, I've actually went out to Nacogdoches, Texas, which is about two and a half hours east of Dallas to, to do a workshop for the Deep uh, East Texas Cybersecurity Group. So I went out there and did a web, web app pen testing workshop for them. And then also I did one in Hearst, Texas, which is about 30 miles west of Dallas near Fort Worth. So there's been a few Pwn School things outside of uh, the Dallas area that weren't virtual. And so my professional background, just to kind of give you some detail, and, and I share this because, you know, there's people wanting to get into pen testing and they want to know how to get started. So uh, I started out as a sysadmin in 1997, did sysadmin work for about six years, went into network security, did network security for a little over, for about a year and a half, and then moved into application security. The company I worked for hired a CISO, and he was a little more familiar with uh, how modern uh, security organizations were set up. So we were all doing the same thing at first. Everyone was doing network security, but when he came along, he put everyone in different groups. I fortunately got put into application security, and that's where I learned about pen testing. So my career from about September 2005 to March 2012 was spent in application security, and I found out about different I found out about pen testing because I was managing some third-party application pen tests we had done, as well as doing web application vulnerability scanning. Uh, and so that, so that really got me interested there. I attended some vendor talks to learn more about it. And so really got interested in, if it wasn't for application security, I don't know if I would have become a pen tester or that would have been later in my career than when it actually happened. So in 2012, March, 2012, I got laid off from my job and I applied for a consulting job and fortunately got it. And one of the things that helped and, and keep this mind in, in mind if you're starting out, that one of the biggest things that helped me is I have a home, I had a home lab. And so still do have a home lab, but I had a home lab and I told him that, uh, you know, I taught myself how to, to do web design. At one time I had a side business doing web design. So I was doing all this learning on my own. So I learned how to, to set up Apache web server, set up, uh, send mail and run my own DNS servers and all this. So uh, when I started out as a sysadmin, I was also doing Linux. So he saw some of these things I was doing. He liked the fact that alone had a, a home lab. He liked that I was passionate and wanting to learn. So that was a big plus. Whenever it came to learning and education on our team, he always encouraged us to build stuff. He wasn't really talking about uh, going out and going out and, uh, you know, taking these pen testing courses, he was talking about building stuff, you know, so you need to understand the technology before you can find the flaws or even secure the technology. And so I've been, have over a little over nine years worth of pen testing experience. And as I mentioned, I just, just celebrating my eight year anniversary of my OSCP certification. Then like the following, then I end up taking some web app pen testing stuff and get more focused on that. Cause the first year of my career was general pen testing. So web application and network. And then I got to, to do just dedicated uh, application pen testing for a year before I switched companies I was working for. So I spent the first five years of my career as a consultant. So if you ever get the chance to consult, uh, I highly recommend it because you're, you know, most cases you could be a dedicated resource on a long-term project and that's only place you work. But in my case, as well as most consultings, consultants experience they're getting moved around in different locations so I was working different industries you know the airline industry I got to test some major airlines applications and networks and other different retail companies and that sort of thing so it's a good experience because you're staying one company depending on the size of the company there's no, there may not be much opportunity to learn different things so it's a really good experience started out and I was in the tribe of hackers red team uh, edition Marcus Carey invited me to to share, answer some questions. And the Tribe of Hackers books are, are awesome because anyone trying to get it started in security or people in security, it's pretty interesting to see how people answer some of these questions. So they ask them different questions that, that they kind of did a survey to ask people questions. What kind of uh, information would you like to know from these 
experienced security professionals. And the Tribe of Hackers original book was just basically general security, but then they got started to specialize. You have the Tribe of Hackers red team, which I was in, the Tribe of Hackers blue team, and then they had the Tribe of Hackers leadership. And so Marcus Carey got the idea for these books from Tribe of Mentors. So Tribe of Mentors, uh, you know, was a book, that, similar format, but not basically just security, but sharing different information. And so this is kind of the inspiration for, for that book. And so during that, after the book was out, uh, Wiley Publishing reached out to me, asked me if I was interested in writing a book. And I give this talk, which was actually a lecture in my ethical hacking class called, and I eventually called the Pentester Blueprint and started giving at conferences. First conference was at B-Sides DFW in 2018. First conference outside of uh, a B-Sides conference and the second conference I gave it at was a HUSEC con. So it really caught on. I was doing a lot of talks and I would share the slides after the presentations. And I thought, you know, this is interesting information that, uh, you know, a lot of people would, would you know, benefit from. So when Wiley Publishing asked me if I was interested in writing a book, so I said, sure. So I started out writing it on my own, but along with the other projects and things that I had going on, you know, doing conferences, conference stuff, as well as teaching at, at uh, Dallas College and then my day job, uh, I was having a hard time getting the book completed. So I reached out to Kim Crowley. Uh, Kim is a great, a great uh, writer. She does a lot of blog posts and she's actually worked in security and technology. So she had that background. So I got someone to help me out write the book that knew something about the subject, which, you know, she brought a lot of value to that book and things that were her idea, like interviewing different people and some jobs that might help you as a pen tester, even like being a barista and those sort of things, showing how the skills you get there are transferable. So, so if you haven't checked that book out and you're getting started, a lot of people that have read it said it's a good place to start. You know, if you're wanting to become a pen tester, even some people that have been working in the field found some helpful tips from it. And so I also have a podcast called the Hacker Factory Podcast, and I interview different people from hobbyists that have gotten their, getting, uh, got, you know, acquired pen testing certifications or people that do bug bounty up to some really experienced elite level hackers. So it's a pretty interesting podcast and people share their stories of how they got started, advice, on how others can get started and tell about their story. So it's a lot of fun. I'm an Innocent Lives Foundation ambassador. So I help bring awareness to the Innocent Lives Foundation as well as raise money. Innocent Lives Foundation, if you're not aware, uh, they help unmask child predators. So they de-OSINT and find information on these child predators. And they send that on to law enforcement for them to, to apprehend, try to apprehend these, these offenders. And so ILF Fest is coming up pretty soon next month, July 10th. So you should check that out. Uh, if you're interested in donating to the Innocent Lives Foundation, let me know and I can share information with you there. And I'm also a Hacking is Not a Crime Advocate and board member. And this next slide, we'll discuss a little bit more about Hacking is Not a Crime. But I share this slide with my class each semester. With great power comes great responsibility. Uh, when I first heard this quote, it was in Spider-Man. Uncle Ben was telling Peter, with great power comes great responsibility. And I found out later on that it was originally a Voltaire quote. And then as I researched and done other conference talks, I found out that maybe it wasn't Voltaire that originally said it after all. But at any rate, this is, uh, I like to share that because once you learn how to hack, and you'll see this, once anyone knows you're doing anything related to security, you're going to get someone saying, hey, can you hack my ex's Facebook? even up to things that are more malicious and uh, a little more criminal activities. At Dallas Hackers Association, we had people come in all the time asking to how to, to how to hack this or that or hack, you know, wanting people to hack into their significant others' Facebook accounts or Instagram. And so you want to be careful. Even if someone approaches you, say, hey, you want to do a pen test for me, make sure that the target that you're testing is theirs and you have written permission to do that because if you get a criminal record it's going to make it a lot more it's a lot more difficult to do anything in technology or security i've known programmers that have gotten trouble and and it's really hard for them to find jobs so if you're going to be an ethical hacker or a pen tester you know you really want to make 
sure that you're you're careful. There's a lot of opportunities out there for like bug bounties and different platforms that you can practice hacking on, like hack the box and try hack me. So there's really no need to, you know, to get yourself in trouble with that. So be really careful, you know, maybe attempting that some vulnerability comes out, you find something on Shodan, but just, you know, leave it alone, don't get in trouble. So, you know, uh, hacking is not a crime as an organization is trying to educate media and society that not all hacking is bad. And actually, I think we have Lola on here is actually an advocate. And so basically, we're trying to get the word out about, uh, you know, hacking, because it was, really, you know, when it started out, hacking was pretty much just, it was more programming and more do it yourself building stuff, because a lot of your, you know, you think of hackathons, hackathons are nothing to do with the CDF, it's CTF, it's writing code. And so that's where the hacking term came from. And so uh, over the years, the media started referring to cyber criminals as hackers. And now anytime you hear anything bad, you see hackers. And when you work in the industry, then, you know, that kind of kind of gets annoying after a while because it's like, you know, uh, locksmith skills can be used for good or bad. Same thing with hack, ethical hacking skills or hacking skills. So they can be used for good or bad. So hacking is not a crime. We're just basically trying to tell people. And one of the things I kind of recently shared with, uh, I'm actually on the board there as well as an advocate shared with our team that, you know, we need to start putting out articles and posts anytime someone does something good, you know, if we know someone in the community that has raised money for a charity, you know, food banks, that sort of thing, or they're doing volunteer work to say, start putting articles out there, hacker helps, you know, orphans or hacker helps food bank. That way people will start seeing that as much as they're seeing, you know, hackers do cyber crime, which not all hackers are, are bad. And, uh, and so a lot of them take offense to that. And so even before hacking is not a crime came about, Chris Roberts was trying to educate the world about hacking. You know, it's not always a bad thing. So you see that there a lot. And what hacking is not a crime does, when it started out, Brian Mackinich founded hacking is not a crime. And the first you know, thing people heard of it was at uh, DEF CON in, in 2018. Brian printed up a lot of these stickers. You see his logo, hacking is not a crime to give out. And it was inspired by, you know, you know, Brian was a skateboarder and they said sticker skateboarding is not a crime because, you know, a lot of places didn't allow skateboards. And so he had the idea of using this to try to bring awareness. And so Chloe Mistoggy teamed up with him and she's got like a political science background. She's worked in politics, helping people out early in her career before she got involved in cybersecurity. So she has the activist background, the working with legislator, 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 traders and legislators and uh, media. So she's helping getting the word out, trying to get petitions signed and really giving this thing a little more power besides uh, just the, you know, the visualization just being out there in the public. So she's bringing a little more substance to it to help and reaching out to different media companies and asking them, could you use cyber criminal? Could you describe, you know, these people in a different way? And so so that's there. And then also, if you're trying to communicate with others in the field and you're wanting to learn this stuff, so be able to speak the language and be able to, you know, properly respect the people for their skill set, you know, just kind of watch the way you say things. And so we're going to go over today, we're going over a web app pen testing overview. We're going to cover some methodology, some different tools, some lab setups, and then some further learning because once when, when you leave here today, I want you to have, you know, this is a this is an introduction class. And so this is uh, you know, it it takes some time to learn this topic and takes practice. So you're not gonna learn that all in one lab. I mean, one workshop. You could do like an eight uh eight hour a day, five day long class, and you're gonna pick things up, but you know, it's just to get good at this, you've got to spend time learning. So so I'm going to give you some, some uh, resources there that you can use. So kind of a, an overview of pen testing in general. So pen testing is assessing security. You know, pen testing assesses the security of a target from a threat actor's perspective. Notice I said threat actor. You know, this could be a nation state. This could be a script kitty. Uh, this is from that perspective, because you've got internet facing applications that the whole world can get to. And uh, anyway, you can 
So you're trying to take that approach to secure, to trying to break into things. Because sometimes if you run a vulnerability scan, you're going to see the vulnerabilities, but there may be things lying underneath that you don't, you're not going to be able to realize unless you hack into it. So if some system is exploitable and you're able to exploit it, if the service account that's running that service that you are able to exploit has lower level access, then you're going to have to elevate privileges. And even there's some things you can do as a lower level user. So be able to hack into that and do other things really uh, shows the impact of that vulnerability. If it's exploitable, it's a higher impact and, you, and it's you know higher risk. So you want to make sure that those things are being remediated. You know, companies don't want, you know, sometimes it's not a matter of they don't want to be secure. It's the expense of it, the priority. They've got limited staff and they don't have time to spend on certain things. So they got to budget that time wisely like they do their money. So if they know this is an exploitable vulnerability, then that kind of gives them justification to go to the business side or to the board to get money to buy. Maybe it may require a new firewall. Maybe the old firewalls are outdated, not doing the trick. Maybe they don't have, have a web application firewall and that's going to help mitigate some of those risks. So that can help them justify things. I've done pen tests before uh, a large international law firm that we did a, uh, a pen test for, we got there and their chief security officer, you know, worked for the companies for years. The guy was really sharp, knew what he was doing. And they've been recommending for years, hey, this application needs to be fixed. We need a different time card application. It's connected to the network. The system is vulnerable. And so it needs to be fixed. So they didn't listen to them. So sometimes bringing in a pen tester, sometimes a consultant will help people achieve their goals because this, this chief security officer kept pointing to different vulnerable applications and stuff. This could be interesting, check this out. Just kind of pointing us because he was wanting that stuff to end up on the report so they could finally get it validated. Sometimes companies don't purposely ignore their employees, but sometimes if there's a third party that's agreeing with their, their thoughts on something, then uh, a lot of times it's more likely that that's gonna get approved. And at the same time there, I've seen pen tests before where people have accepted risk you know, I was performing a pen test and from SQL injection vulnerability, I was able to get command line access to the server, dump the password hash and crack it. And the company filed a risk exception because it was a, uh, it was a development application. So it was in a development environment. So they said, it's not production. So we were going to file a risk exception. But the thing was, I was able to get onto that network, which wasn't segregated from production and I was able to get from the internet internally. So sometimes, you know, the risks and stuff, people file risk acceptance and you have a hard time getting things uh, remediated, but sometimes pen test will sh show reasons to do that. So also pen testing for most of you, you probably know this, you've, you know, you're taking this workshop. So I'm sure you've heard something about pen testing that you're interested in. So pen testing is also referred to as ethical hacking. Some of the terms you're seeing related around these areas to a red team, whereas true red team is more adversary simulation. So you're really more trying to emulate a threat actor and less likely about trying to just find vulnerabilities. So kind of the difference between, you know, red teaming is being used generically for all offensive security. I think really offensive security, offensive cyber security is a better description because, you know, blue team, not everyone does anything on blue team, but with, uh, with your, Red teaming, you're doing more adversary emulation. A pen test, those are, are useful because when you're doing a pen test that you're going through and uh, you're trying to find every vulnerability that's exploitable, a red teamer is trying to find something that would lead to a breach. So they're not going through trying to find every vulnerability and exploit every single vulnerability. They'll go in and find one way in. Maybe they need a backup for persistence if they lost connection. And so some of these details I'm telling you about is just a general uh, overview of pen testing in general, which I think it's important to know. In web app pen testing, you don't get into so much of the adversary emulation stuff, but I think it's just important to know the difference. So when you're able to, you're talking to someone about pen testing, you're applying for a job somewhere, you may get asked questions that may not be really related, but maybe you may do some of these things later on in that role. So you may start out doing web app pen test and maybe you'll do some red teaming down the road. So 
think it's important that you know that. And so there's other areas that web app pen testing skills are helpful for. So of course, application security analysts. Uh, so you're using this. Sometimes you may be actually doing pen tests. You may just be responsible for managing third-party pen tests, but sometimes you're actually doing the pen test. And knowing how to do pen tests, run vulnerability scans is important. So a generalist pen tester means you're going to be doing, you're not specialized. You're not a specialist. You're doing network pen test, maybe some Wi-Fi pen test and some light application. And then you have your like dedicated application pen testers. And even if you're a generalist, this is going to come in handy because as these endpoint protections evolve and improve, then if you're going to exploit anything in that system, get a foothold, if you're going to be able to hack anything on that system, sometimes it's going to be web-based. So sometimes your um, some of your different management consoles for security tools and different IT tools are sometimes web app based. So it may be running some Java server and they've got a Java app for administering that particular security product. So sometimes you're able to get in, you know, and just sometimes they use web front ends to administer stuff. I had a pen test one time that I was doing that uh, I was able to exploit. It was uh, JBoss uh, Java server. It's a Red Hat product, kind of similar, similar type of thing to uh, Apache uh, Tomcat, which is a Java ser application server. So through that, I was able to get find some default credentials, get access to that system. And it wasn't like an application per se, but I was able to exploit a web-based system to gain a foothold into the network. So I was able to uh, dump credentials. I was able to connect to using RDP to a system. Once I gained access to that, I was able to run invoke Mimikatz and dump other passwords, usernames and passwords. And so actually back to the, how I got that, the default credentials allowed me to RDP to that system. And I was able to upload something that would give me a shell to that system. So just be able to exploit the web piece of that was able to give me access to the network. So I wasn't finding anything exploitable on Windows directly without having access to the system. So, so that's where it's helpful there. And that's one of the things like some of your, I took, when I got my, I got the SANS web app pen testing certification. And one of the things I'd say that that course is more helpful for is if you're wanting, if you're a network pen tester and you need to learn some web app, it's kind of an introduction. It's not really in depth. If you're really wanting to learn web app pen testing in more detail than something like, uh, INE's WAPT course, the web app pen testing course, that one gets in a little more detail because before I took the GWAPT course, I took INE at the time it was eLearn Security web, eLearn Security's web app pen testing course. And I learned more from that than I did the SANS course. So it's going to depend, you know, you get into the more advanced uh, web app pen testing courses in SANS, it's going to get into a little more detail, but, uh, from that course compared to the two. If I had took the SANS course first, then maybe I would have learned more from it. It was going, I was going with experience from web app pen testing and taking the eLearn security or INE course. So there's different types of pen tests here. So your black box are also is referred to as a blind pen test, meaning you have no sight into that target. So you're testing this from like an attacker approach. So the malicious actor, uh, you know, threat actor, script kitty, nation state, whatever is trying to access this application, then you're testing it the same way they would. So you're not, you know, you're, you're not, you're not having information or accounts on there. So you get to the next level, which is the opposite end of the spectrum. And you have your white box also referred to crystal box. And this is all about vision. So you, you get like crystal is a way to look into it. You're able to see into the system, think of it as an x-ray. You're, you're seeing the details behind the behind that layer. And so a lot of you want, you're using accounts for this. So you're going to use uh, accounts. You're, ideally, you're going to want to have user accounts for each level of access because even an administrator doesn't need to be able to see people's social security numbers or some of their, their personal information. So some of this does not be, need to be accessible from someone with administrator, administrator access. And the same thing, you don't want a low-level user that say you've got a banking app, you don't want your customer to be able to get on there 
elevate their privileges and view other people's accounts, do administrative functions. So you want to test these different levels. And during a white box pen test, some people will say, some people that are hardcore hackers, they just think this is not the way to test. But one of the things I will say, with the white box pen tests, you're going to test that system more thoroughly. Whereas, you know, uh, there, is, there is merit to the black box pen test. And the gray box is kind of a cross between the other two types. And this is what you're going to typically, typically see on your network pen test. You're going to more likely see gray box. And so this uh, gray box test, you're not, you don't have accounts, but you're going to have like IP addresses, URLs, and that sort of thing. So you're going to have the information needed to test. Uh, black box, you're going to have to collect all that. So you're going to, it's going to be relying on you to do more uh, OSINT, working on a recon, pulling information on that system. So it's going to be dependent on you to do that. With the white box test, you've got that information. So really the kind of the way you want to approach web app pen testing is you want to do authenticated and unauthenticated. So I'd say you'd want to kind of start out uh, with, you know, doing unauthenticated, see if you can break into the system that's exploitable first off, because they're going to want to know if they can do that. So you want to try that. And then you're going to use the different accounts and authenticate and test. And, and as you collect that information, you're gonna go back and see, okay, I found this. Now go back and see if you can get to that area, something you discovered as administrator, can you get to that as a, a low level user or just a normal user of the account? So you wanna make sure that you can't get to those. So that, so that testing is there. And also kind of to get into some more details too, uh, you have different levels of, security assessments. So you have like regular vulnerability scanning where you're just running your web application vulnerability scanner and, or even network, it could be like a network uh, vulnerability scan. So you run these and basically you just take the report and then you hand it off to the different uh, IT groups to go through and remediate these. So you're really not in this, in that type of role or that type of process, you're not really looking to validate. So the next step is going to be a vulnerability assessment. And so with a vulnerability assessment, you're going to do your vulnerability scan and you'll also use other tools like port scanners, like Nmap, different open source tools to look for vulnerabilities. But at the same time, you're gonna go back, anything you find with that vulnerability scanner, you're gonna validate it. You're going to see if you can manually validate it, maybe even use another uh, vulnerability scanner or either other manual techniques to make sure that it's a valid finding because vulnerability scanners will find false positives because sometimes it looks for certain signatures and just because it's a certain version, they assume it's, you know, it's exploit that it's vulnerable to these, these uh, certain, certain security risks. And so uh, you wanna make sure because there could be some kind of mitigating control in, in place. So you're validating these findings and once you validate those findings, you, you basically, you, you document that in your report. So that's a vulnerability assessment. So a pen test is going one step further in not only are you validating those vulnerabilities, you're also seeing if they're exploitable. So if they're exploitable, you try to exploit those vulnerabilities. And so that's kind of the difference there. And you'll see the, you'll see the acronym VAPT and that kind of refers to pen testing and vulnerability assessment in general. Someone on you know, LinkedIn has a job opening and they will say that they're looking for someone for VAPT, which is basically a uh, that uh, that's vulnerability assessment penetration testing. So that's so you kind of do both. There's some cases that you may be testing some systems that they don't want you to perform a pen test. I did uh, a pen test for a a hospital back years ago during my consulting career. I was doing a Wi-Fi pen test, and when I got in there testing. You know, we're, I was talking to the, the chief information security officer, and he really had some concerns with, you know, actually performing a penetration test. So we went back and kind of adapted, and I did a vulnerability assessment. So since we weren't, since penetrating targets was out of scope, trying to exploit any of those vulnerabilities, what we did is I did like a review of their controllers, their Wi-Fi controllers that their access points are connected to. That way we did a uh, security review of that. So that way that's another layer, even though they're not able to penetrate because whenever I was doing the scans, originally what caused this is I was going through doing nothing happened as far as just some of the things I saw, 
I saw a concern and went back and talked to the to the CISO. And as a consultant, even as an internal employee, you see things that concern you. Make sure to discuss that with other people because, say, for instance, if I'd went on with the pen test, uh, I could have taken down equipment that was in the operating room or the emergency room. I was seeing this different medical devices connected on the Wi-Fi network, and this caused some concern. So you want to be careful when you're doing that. And so sometimes that case, that's a vulnerability assessment. That's the safest bet. Some of your, your OT or ICS environments where you've got industrial controls, different types of power plants, water treatment facilities, different machinery operated by computers. Sometimes there's people's lives at risk. If you did a pen test and you took something down, someone could get injured or killed by machinery. So a lot of those environments are pretty careful there. They don't want a penetration test run and they're really cautious about vulnerability scans. So there's cases when a vulnerability scan may be more applicable. And sometimes when you're doing web app pen tests, you're actually doing a penetration test, but you may not successfully penetrate that target. So that's one of the things with web app pen testing compared to network pen testing. If you really like the idea of hacking into something, getting command line access or taking control of the system, you know, the likelihood of that in, in the web app realm is not as much. So those are some kind of things to keep in mind there. But it's kind of fun. You want to go back and forth between, because my second year in pen testing, I got moved over to the application pen testing team. And all I was doing was application pen tests. And so I kind of got bored with that. And so, uh, I ended up changing companies. I went to a different consulting company where I was doing web app pen test, Wi-Fi pen test. Actually, I got to learn Wi-Fi pen testing with that company and expand my skill set. So I was getting, I was really missed not getting to do the network stuff. So I went somewhere where I was doing a mixture. And then after years of doing that, actually my preference now, I'm more interested in web app pen testing. It's just, I've done enough of the network stuff that it, that's not as interesting anymore to me. And so the web app pen testing area is a lot more interesting to me now. And so, and that could change too. That's like anything else, your interest, you do something long enough, you get bored and you want to do something else. So, you know, if you're, if you like vari variation and variety, then sometimes maybe not specializing is a good idea. But one of the things about special specialization is it allows you to get better at something because if you try to, learn everything, you can get to a decent level of everything. But if you look at some of these people that are writing these Active Directory hacking tools, they've specialized in network pen testing and they're really not messing with the, the, the web piece of it. They're more focused on Active Directory hacking and that sort of thing. Or some people get more caught up in the red teaming and so they get, they're not doing the web app as much. But there's some, there's some benefits to doing the web app pen testing. We'll cover some of those later. So as far as you need a methodology, because what's the advantage of a pen testing methodology? You're, you've got a, a process that you can duplicate uh, time after time. So that's going to keep the quality and the depth that you're testing the same or better each time. And that way across a team, everyone that is um, performing pen tests are using a similar, uh, a similar type of uh, process and making sure they're they're getting full coverage and you can adapt the way you do things as time goes on. If you find better ways of doing things, a lot of teams will try to automate the easy stuff. So, uh, so that's kind of the benefit of that. And so the penetration testing execution standard is a really good standard to follow here. Now, this is not just for web app. This is also for, for network and other, other types of pen testing. And we're going to go ahead and take a look at this up closer. And so this, uh, and you'll see here shortly, the people that help come up with this are some of the, some of the best in the industry. And so we're going to go back and look at the, uh, let's see what we got here, main page. But yeah, you got like uh, 
Dave Kennedy is one of the contributors, Carlos Perez, uh, Chris Gates. Okay, there they are. I was missing it. So you can see some of the people involved in creating this. Chris Nickerson from Lars Consulting. This is like a really well-known boutique pen testing firm. And when you hear the term boutique pen testing firm, that they specialize in it. Some of your other consulting companies do a lot of different types of testing, but you know, companies like this, they specialize in it. So Chris Nickerson helped uh, contribute to this. So did Dave Kennedy, as mentioned. Dave Kennedy runs Trusted Sec. Uh, you, if you're on InfoSec Twitter or anything, if you plugged into to, you know into security at all, you know of Dave Kennedy. And then some other people here, Justin Cyril, he is at N Guardians and he also creates a lot of the courses for, for SANS. I took an ICS course, ICS pen testing course last year is created by Justin. I think he's, he's contributed to or created uh, like some of their web app pen testing courses there. And so Chris Gates as mentioned, mentioned here, uh, Chris Gates, he was at Lars, but he's not there anymore. He's, he's changed. This is, this hadn't been updated since like 2014, but it's still good information. Some of the technical stuff has changed because they'll go through and show you some different tools and stuff to use. And so that, that's kind of changed. And so John Strand from Black Hills Information Security Group. So you can see this is like a who's who of people in the security world. Also Joe McRae, Joe McRae is a consultant. He also uh, does a lot of training around penetration testing and stuff. And so like Carlos Perez, he's actually at Trusted Sec now, but he was at Tenable Security. That's the people that created Nessus. So you can see this, this hasn't been updated in a while, but it's still good information and you can kind of see who came up with it. Okay, so it was last edited on uh, in 2017. So it's not, not too bad. But the main things about these methodologies are going to stay the same. Some of your some of your technical stuff is going to going to change. Yeah, Michael mentioned Joe McRae has an awesome YouTube channel. Yeah, I used to, when I was getting started out, I think it was actually before I even got into pen testing, I attended some of his, because he had some online courses that he recorded. And some of them weren't necessarily video courses. Some of them would be like a, you know, kind of a booklet or worksheet workbook that he created that would take you through teach you about different types of pen testing. And I know he got more into the video side of things. And um, so he had some courses. He was like one of the first independents out there providing pen testing content. And so here we got like uh, the different sections of the pen te penetration testing execution standard, your pre-engagement interactions. So some of these you're not going to be as in depth then when you're starting out because so as a pen tester and you're not like scoping pen tests and stuff then you're going to be doing intelligence gathering threat modeling vulnerability analysis exploitation post exploitation and report writing but the pre-engagement stuff is important because if you go through here the ptes so if you ever decide you want to do pen testing on the side this is one of the first things i would look at because they're kind of telling you here i mean they even get into details of payment terms which first you know as far as just learning the pen testing, this is not so much important to you, but some of the questionnaires. So like if you're scoping, you know, a pen test and one of the things as a consultant or a pen tester is to spend the time to really work through with your customer or your fellow employees to really scope these pen tests well, because a lot of times people are, okay, this may be a requirement for PCI DSS uh, certification or to be uh, compliant. So this is what they're looking for, but you need to guide, sometimes it's a good idea to guide them. They may not understand what all that entails. So helping them out along the way, or if you see areas that they need help with, you can tell that even after the pen test, once you perform the pen test, it's a good idea to share other areas for improvement or other areas that may need to be tested. Because as a consultant, one of the things we did is we looked through their environment. If I went into some place and they had bad physical security, then I would recommend social engineering engagement and physical security assessment. Or if I saw they had a lot of web app while I'm doing this network pen test, I would recommend doing a web app pen test. So it's kind of up to you to help 
them. You know, you're a trusted advisor and they're wanting to, to be able to secure their environment. So you're going to try to help them as much, as much as you can. And so one of the things too, when you're writing a report on a pen test, you know, as we're mentioning things you find for opportunity, things that need to be tested later. One of the things too, is also, if you see something good, I've done pen tests for companies and they had really great physical security controls. And I made sure to document that in the report because, you know, a pen test is testing the security posture and it, and that doesn't matter just specifically for the target or what's in scope. If you see something, you know, pretty obvious that uh, needs attention, you want to bring that up. So, you know, I've, I've had customers that had really good physical controls in place and I noted that in the, in the report. And that also helps too, because, you know, someone gets a lot of bad news. It's kind of like, do you want to hear the good news first or the bad news? So it's kind of that thing. So it kind of helps soften the blow and you don't want your customer to feel like they're being attacked. So you're want, when you're going in, you're wanting to build that rapport. You're wanting to go in and say, hey, we're on the same side. You're wanting to be secure. I'm trying to find any opportunities for you to make things more secure. Some of your, your different IT folks may get uh, a little upset because they've worked really hard at this. And they, they may think they've done their best and you're able to get into it. So just the way you approach them, it's not like you're going to, you don't want to go in and say, hey, we hacked the heck out of you. You know, you want to just go in and be professional about it and starting the engagement, you really want to set that tone. We're on the same team. This is what I'm going to do. It's not like a, it's not a competition. It's not a challenge. I'm not out to make you look bad. We're on the same team. So those are some good things to level set there. So these general questions, you can see things related to, so network pen test. So this is going to be related to anything. So testing after hours, during business hours or on weekends. Sometimes companies are going to want their applications or their targets tested off peak hours because they don't want the systems to be taken down, which it doesn't always happen, but it does happen at times if someone's doing a vulnerability scan and reboots or crashes a system. So you don't want that to, to happen. So, and sometimes people have the mindset that if a system goes down, they want it during business hours where all their support people are there to fix. And this isn't like a common thing, but it, it does worry the people you're testing. You know, if they've had pen tests before, had a bad experience, then they worry about those kind of things. So the hours when you're going to be testing is important. This is going to be across your web app pen test as well for your network, how many IP addresses. So you're just defining the scope here with these questionnaires. So we get more into the web application realm. So you see how many applications are being assessed. And then you know, a lot of this is important when you're quoting the project because you, you, know, you scope it out and then you, you uh, quote it based on the scope that you've defined. And so you need to know how many pages, if it's a, how many static pages, how many dynamic pages. That way you know how much to charge the customer. There's a feature built into uh, Burp Suite where you can actually go through and it will help you discover how many, you know, a lot of this content that you can quote a, uh, a pen test on. It's also any kind of information. So does the client want fuzzing? Does the client want role-based testing? So as we mentioned, the different levels of access, this is important. You'll ask them if they want that, but that's really something you want to encourage them to do. Because if you're just doing a black box pen test and you're not able to hack into it, doesn't mean it's not vulnerable. Someone had if someone found credentials and got on there, what could they do with it? You know, the authentication piece, getting into the system may be really tough, but once you get in, it may be very insecure. So, so this is also the role-based and credential scans kind of fit in the, the same place. You're testing different roles, so you're going to need different credentials for those. And so you can see you get into the wireless stuff and the physical. So they cover all this. So these are good questionnaires and how to handle scope creeps. So if you're going over the scope and you know there's one thing to always make sure you stay within scope if you find something pretty interesting that's out of scope don't follow it because now you're going outside the scope and if you're a consultant you know that could cause you know a chance you're not going to get return business if you crash something or you do something unauthorized you know you can cause some trouble for yourself and your company that you're working for so make sure and just also like they mentioned dealing with third parties if it's a cloud hosted application you know Hosting a data center, make sure that people are aware you're testing and you have permission. Your ISPs and you know a lot of this and your managed uh, security service providers and stuff, some of these 
apps and things or hosted different sites. So getting permission there and also also getting put on the whitelist if this where you don't get blocked by the WAF, the web application firewall, because what happens there is if something, if they don't disable or add you to the allow list and you're testing and you can't get past anything and you're not able to bypass, you know, use techniques to bypass the web application firewall, then what happens is that web application firewall fails, then all those vulnerabilities that were protected are going to be exposed. You know, maybe there's some of those things you can't fix, but you want to be able to test without that web application firewall in place. And so you also want to know where servers are hosted. There's different laws in different countries. You want to make sure that you're, you're careful there. Uh, acceptable social engineering pretext. So a lot of times with the web app pen testing, that's not going to be in scope, but this is some good thing to know as far as a pen tester. DOS denial of service testing, you know, usually people are going to tell you they don't want that. And it's rare that anyone's going to ask you to do denial of service testing because they can do testing, uh, you know, their capabilities and uh, the load of the system. There's different tools out there. Your QA teams will test, you know, the capacity of servers and make sure that, okay, we're rolling out this application. We've, we're going to have, you know, 20,000 users a day hit this application, we're going to make sure that we've got enough resources that it's not taken down. So they may do that outside of that, but you're not going to typically be doing denial of service testing. Although there are some vulnerabilities that could cause denial of service, but you just note that. So if you find something that's a denial of service vulnerability, you just denote, you just note that in your report and be careful when you're using uh, Metasploit because you ever see a vulnerability that says DOS on there, it's a DOS exploit. So it's going to do a denial of service on that system. So you want to be careful of that. And so, so yeah, you get into your, your terms and all that stuff. So this stuff, your the pre-engagement stuff, you know, a lot of times when you're starting out, you're not going to be in, involved with that. So your intelligence gathering, so you're collecting information on the target. Some of this can be done through OSINT. And as far as like a, a web app pen testing engagement, you're not doing as much of this stuff. So you're basically uh, scanning the system. It doesn't, figuring out what all's running on that system. But, you know, when you get into your red teaming or other types of, or your pen testing, sometimes it's important to know stuff about physical locations. And because, you know, I've, I've done uh, red team engagements to where we only knew the physical location, the address. We knew the name of the company, but no one gave us specific URLs or IP address ranges. It was for us, up to us to do all the OSINT and collect that information. So some of your OSINT, you'll try to do like some subdomain enumeration because there may be some subdomains that are vulnerable. So your OSINT, you're basically collecting your information there. Then you get into you know your, your DNS re related uh, information collecting your vulnerabilities, you know, your, you know, your, your, uh, you get into your port scans, looking for open services and stuff, trying to detect what, what all's running on the system. So collecting that information. So what you, ideally, what you want to do with your OSINT or your intelligence gathering, you want to take, if you say, if you're doing a black box pen, pen test, you're wanting to take that from a black box as close to a crystal box or white box pen test as you can. So the more information you have on that target, the better. So. Another thing back to the three types of pen tests, a black box or blind pen test is going to take longer time to do because you're trying to collect information. You're trying to find vulnerabilities. You're trying to find things to exploit. Uh, with the crystal box, you've got more information. So less time spent on your OSINT and stuff and more time uh, actually performing testing. So your threat modeling, this kind of gets a little detail there. You know, as you, if you're getting into pen testing, you know, I would recommend starting to learn threat modeling. Some of your web app pen tests and, you know, your basic network pen tests, sometimes you're not really doing threat modeling because you're looking for the threat vectors and some of these things are pretty common. You're testing a Windows box, you have a good idea of those. Where threat modeling really comes in a helpful is uh, with 
special specific devices in something, for instance, like an ATM. Uh, I used to manage third party ATM pen tests for a bank I used to work for. And it was pretty interesting to see because the things you take in consideration being involved in that threat modeling, because we have different APM models. And one of the things to take in consideration is environment. So if you've got this ATM, like in downtown Chicago, Manhattan, downtown Dallas, then you're going to want to make sure that the physical security is really good. It's high traffic. And you just want to take in consideration the area you're at. And then you, when you get somewhere like more rural areas, say a, a convenience store with an ATM outside, and maybe there's not, you know, 24 hour, hour security and someone's not really monitoring that, then the, the chance of a physical breach is going to be even higher because someone can sit there and goof around with the ATM machine before they get detected and law enforcement comes in to, you know, try to stop them from attacking the ATM machine. And, and it also goes into the complexity, you know, ATMs are more than just the computer piece. You've got a, you've got logic and applications controlling the money trays that is actually dispensing the money on those devices. So you're having to, 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 you know, take in consideration the special, specially hardware like OC, OC, OT and ICS, you know, you've got some kind of device that's connected to a system. You want to see, you know, you need to kind of check and see where are the most likely areas to be, you know, attacked. And then, like I said, like the environment. So if you've got an ATM inside of a, you know, a lobby where there's always a security guard there, you know, you're going to look at other, there, other types of attacks are going to be more common. And that's what you're going to, to do your threat vector, you know, you're going to map out your uh, threat modeling. So that's a good one to get into. So typically, you know, your standard type of tests. Uh, you're not going to get in a lot of detailed threat modeling, but it's good to know as you advance in your career and do more complex things, then you're going to need to do threat modeling. So who am I? Raise their hand. Uh, who am I? If you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A. Or actually, I can, I'll, I'll allow you to talk. So if you want to talk and what, what is your question? So who am I? You can I get, see your hand raised. So if you want, I got you set to where you can ask a question. If, if you don't want to, to speak the question, then you can actually type it in the chat or put it in the, the QA feature and I can answer your question there. Okay, so I guess he's going to... So yeah, at any rate, that's kind of gets into the threat modeling. And then your vulnerability analysis. So this is testing your active and passive stuff. So this is still kind of similar to the, some of the things you're doing with reconnaissance, only you're doing more active reconnaissance. So you're doing your, your vulnerability scans, you're doing your, uh, also your, uh, port and service scans, because like right here shows kind of an example that, you know, the port, this is, this port is able to receive data, close the port is not able to receive data. So, so when you're doing that, you're, you're doing your, your banner grabbing. So sometimes your FTP servers or web servers may have a banner that is going to give you information on the system, because to secure these systems, you really want to be careful of what is exposed out there. So any error messages, you really don't want to reveal the version of the web server or the web application server that's running. Because if me as an attacker, I know you're running a certain version of Apache, I can go on exploit DB and look up that vulnerability. And so your web application vulnerability scanners, your directory brute forcing. So this is where you're kind of doing more of your physical reconnaissance, your enumeration. And then your exploitation. It's also your vulnerability analysis. You're going to look at all the information you collected. You're going to look at and see what can be exploited. You're validating vulnerabilities. 
And then once you validated they're vulnerable, then you try to see if there's exploits for them and you try to exploit. So there's the exploitation phase. So, uh, you know, you try to see if you're doing network pen test, you try to see if you can bypass some of the antiviruses by encoding, like here's the encoding, packing, encrypting, whitelist bypass and all that. So some of this stuff you're going to, you'll try to do like WAF bypass, different evasion techniques. So exploitation is actually the hacking phase. So if it's vulnerable, you're trying to see what you can, you can exploit on a system. And in, in the case of a web application pen test, you may not be getting system control. You may be uh, able to reveal like information, maybe through SQL injection or some other type of vulnerability that can leak information that you're able to collect that information. So, so you try to exploit there and then now you've got your post exploitation. So this is like your lateral movement. This is your, so lateral movement means you're going, moving from one machine to another. Maybe you're able to use, reuse credentials. Uh, maybe you're connected to some system that you can pivot to that you couldn't otherwise. Uh, privilege escalation. So you're going to try to go from a normal user. If you're not already uh, admin, root, or a uh, network system authority, I mean, or, or the NT system authority, which is basically uh, running as that, that machine itself. So you've got like the highest level of access to that system. So you're trying to see if you can escalate privileges. You're also seeing any kind of information you can collect. As a pen tester, what sometimes people overlook is they're too, too concerned with getting root or domain admin. And honestly, if you're able to get credit card numbers, different types of personal information, healthcare records, then that, that's the crown jewels there. That's the stuff that ransomware is locking down and companies are paying for. So if you don't have to have a high level privilege access, then you've got access to that. So you don't necessarily have to, to have that. So keep that in mind. You're trying to do look for information. Uh, sometimes on your red team engagements or network, you're trying to see if you can exfiltrate data and when you do this, you want to use some kind of dummy data. So you want some fake credit card numbers to try to exfiltrate. You don't want to be exfiltrating actual data because then you're causing kind of a security incident there itself because you, the data needs to stay secure. Okay, so Pat says, how would you suggest someone who is looking to get into pen testing to volunteer or ride along to learn some tactics and techniques? If you can find someone you know that, that their company would allow you to shadow them, that would be a good thing. I, I'm going to say probably one of the best ways to do that is if you work for a company that has a pen test team, see if you can shadow because a lot of companies are pretty big on, I've seen some companies that let people work in different departments. Not everyone is going to do that. But if you could, uh, you know, even set and look over their shoulder and why, you know, sometimes they'll do that. When it gets outside of, you know, uh, you're, you're an outsider, you don't work for the company, then NDAs, non-disclosure agreements and all that, and getting the permission to do that. But if you know someone works, owns their own consulting company, they're doing pen testing, maybe they can let you do that. Uh, Michael brought up a good one. Internships are awesome. Internships is really one of the best ways to get into security. And that's one of the reasons why I don't, you know, you don't have to have a degree to get in. But one of the, one of the reasons that I really like degrees is if you're going to a college, then it's easier to get an internship otherwise, because really it's, if it's not an internship, it's really more of an apprenticeship and not a lot of companies do apprenticeships. So yeah, I would uh, see if you can show, you know, if they let you shadow them and that that's someone internally, you know, you can just go watch them do a pen test if they allow that. So that's probably gonna be the easy way to do that. Uh, I've, you know, during my pen test career, I've had students ask, but what's prevented that just like, just like uh, internships with the company I work for, you had to be in one of the main offices, same thing with like shadowing a pen test. Even though they could sign NDAs, they had to be on site where a manager was at to be able to, to do the shadow. But bug bounties are a good thing to do. Bug bounties are a good way to get experience. So bug bounties, your hacker one and, and bug crowd, they also do some pen testing. So once you get in their platform, and you start doing pretty well, you might get invited to do one of their pen tests, Cobalt, which is cobalt.io. They start out as a bug bounty company, but now they're just crowdsourced pen testing. And so they've kind of got a low barrier to, to entry. 
they will take people without much experience. If you can, they'll put you through like a technical interview. Same thing with SINAC. They will actually have you uh, go through and perform a pen test of their environment. SINAC actually has you go through, they do their uh, vetting through Hack the Box. So you can do, uh, they've got like a SINAC path and they also have the Dante path. So if you get through any one of those and you pass that and score high enough, that moves you up the list for an interview on Synac Red Team. And I've seen a lot of people either get started through Cobalt or Synac. So yeah, Michael, you didn't apply for a pen testing job. So that, but yeah, you, that's one of the things you should still go back and try is you can sign up for their pen testing with all the stuff you've done. If you get like a technical interview based on all the courses and stuff you took, there's a good chance you're going to pass the technical interview and get on the pen test. And that's ultimately what you want to do. And for a lot of you people on here, system meltdown applied with Cobalt. He was wanting to do like a content creation role and they, he didn't get the job because he didn't have content creation experience. But if you had experience, just like, yeah, Cyber Lola brought up Joe, Joe Helly advice, put yourself out there. So do your own write-ups, do your own content creation. You know, that's what helped him get in. So that helps. Sometimes people may not hire you unless you have content creation experience, but people like Joe, the cyber mentor, they built their careers off of that stuff. I mean, look at cyber mentor, you know, he did all these great educational videos and these courses on Udemy and these free YouTube videos. And the guy's got his own consulting company. You know, sometimes, you know, that's easier said than done, but you know, sometimes you have to make your opportunities. And I really admire these people for taking the risk to do that. So yeah, Cobalt Core. So go through there and apply. Yeah, Joe was his intern. That's correct. I actually had him as a, as a guest on my the Hacker Factory podcast. So yeah, these, these are some things. Pay attention to what some of these people are doing. But you know, this really wasn't a, kind of an option when I was getting started. The content creation stuff, starting a YouTube channel, having a GitHub with scripts that you've wrote. Uh, Cyber Lola does write-ups on, on some of the try hack me and hack the box stuff she does. That's really good because, uh, different companies will see that you've done that also with, with bug bounty, since we're kind of got into getting into, uh, pen testing topic, uh, bug bounties is a good experience. I was interviewing with, actually interviewed with Lars consulting last year and their hiring manager told me that it was easier to find web app pen testers than network pen testers because of bug bounties. So um, that's a, a, uh, a good way to get experience is bug bounties. And so when you do that, you move into it because one of the things, the difference between bug bounty and a pen test is you're only get, you only get paid for what you find. And so while you're doing bug bounty stuff, you're doing a web app pen test. So you gain those skills. And so when you get a interview for a pen testing job, you can kind of describe your methodology how you do things. And that's another important thing of learning method methodology and, and it's and not downplaying, it's important. Learning a methodology and having a methodology that you use, when you're talking to an employer, they're gonna say, ask you, how would you do a pen test? You're gonna use that methodology to describe on that interview to let them know how you do a pen test. And so you're going through the steps and the different tools, discuss how you use those and that can be very, very helpful. So. So yeah, the bug bounty stuff and, you know, Synac Red Team and some of these companies, once you get in, there's opportunities to do some network pen testing because Cobalt Core, the co Cobalt.io, uh, from what I understand, they also do stuff besides just web app pen testing. You know, I believe the same thing with Synac. It's just, it's easier to do web app pen tests. There's a little more, you know, you have to send out Dropbox for internal network pen tests and that sort of thing. And sometimes it takes it takes some time just to be there, improve yourself to get those opportunities. Uh, Cause I know like with bug crowd, I used to be a bug crowd ambassador and with their next gen pen test, if you didn't have pen testing experience and you've been on their platform finding bugs, then they may came up, come up and give you the opportunity to do a next gen pen test. And the difference between pen test and bug bounty is pen test you're getting paid. So like with cobalt core, they pay $1,500 for a pen test. And I think it's like 30 hours worth of pen testing. And it's $1,500. Now you can make more money than that as a pen tester, but you're getting experience. And once you get in, you know how to perform pen tests, then you can go somewhere else, get a job as a full-time pen tester and, and make even more money. So 
I hope that answered your question. And back to the internships, if anyone on here, if you're going to college, you know, get an, take an inter, get on to an internship if you can. Everyone that I've known that have had, that have been an intern has gotten a job with a company. And I've known several people. I've worked with some people that were interns that turned around and actually a few of them, like three of them, when I was at Kimberly Clark, got jobs as uh, in the security industry from doing their internships. Because the internship is going to give you experience because that's why you have a hard time getting jobs because people want all this experience. So your your internships, your Cobalt Core, your your um, also your uh, bug bounty stuff like that. That's going to give you a chance to get get experience. So we kind of covered this stuff here, and then the reporting piece. You know, you're going to have to write up your 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 pen test report. And I know some people don't like to write, but try try to enjoy it because it's kind of fun when you find some really cool bugs or you find some really cool vulnerabilities. You exploited something that makes the pen test report good, and the more effort you put into it. Uh, you know, the more serious they're going to take it. And if you're, if you're just kind of halfway doing it, they just kind of they're really going to question, you know, your skill set and that sort of thing. So really put the time into re reporting. Uh, whenever I went back to school in 2002, I got my associate's degree, or actually went back in 2001, I got my associate's degree because uh, I had my MCSE, Cisco CCNA, CISSP, and my Nobel c &E, and they gave me college credit for that. So the most important class I took when I went back to school was, was writing because I'd learned so much from my English composition class. And so as far as your methodologies go, we kind of covered kind of the pen testing, the PTES execution standard, which is kind of a framework, but a couple of good methodologies here is your OWASP testing guide and the web application hackers handbook. There's their Port Swigger has an online kind of version of this with labs, but the book is still good. The book gets into details. There's like a page with the methodology on here. So that's one of the things you get with the book is they have the methodology listed and some companies, some bug bounty companies that do these next gen penetration tests, they do a combination of these two methodologies. And I don't know that he was the only writer on it, but uh, Jason Haddix they used to work at Bug Crowd. I know he is at least the contributor, if not the main creator of this Burp Suite plugin called Hunt. And there's actually a version out now for, um, for, for OWASP Zap, but it's got the methodology built in there. So you can select Web Application Hackers Handbook, or you can select uh, the OWASP Testing Guide. So yeah, these are some really good ones to get into to check out. And OWASP in general, the OWASP top 10 is really good. You really want to check that out. And there's this OWASP website. You know, you go through the OWASP top 10, and then the testing guide goes through and shows you a lot of good information. They discuss threat modeling. And the thing about this, this resource, this is more current because this is, is constantly being updated. So this is constantly being updated. They're work, this is version 4.2. They're working on version, on version five. Currently that's the next version that's coming out. So 4.2 is the most recent version. You can even get like a PDF download of it, I believe as well. But, but it's kind of nice because it shows you your, you get through here and it says OWASP testing framework. They kind of discuss it before development begins. So just think that some of the stuff that you're seeing in PTES, this is all gonna be more related to web app pen testing. So they even discuss system or software development life cycle on here. And so these are really good information as an application security analyst, it's really good to, to know that. And then you go into the information gathering. So they're showing how to fingerprint web server, conduct search engine discovery, reconnaissance for information leakage. And some of these companies, like I said, like in the next gen pen test, uh, I did one of those and we had, you know, 
we had a methodology. So you went through this checklist to make sure you covered everything. And not only you just visually or physically have this, you go through and you actually check off the things as you test them. So information leakage, so you can do your Google searches. Sometimes you don't think about it, but there's, you know, you can find stuff doing your Google searches that uh, information is leaked, maybe even credentials, information that you can't access through the application that, that you may be able to find out there. Fingerprinting the web server. So you want to know what the, the version is. So they they go through here and show you how. So they're doing banner grabbing. So they're using Telnet. There's all sorts of other ways to do that besides Telnet. Nikto is kind of a way to do that. We'll show that tool here in a little bit. But you're going through and seeing the request. And so you're seeing it's running Nginx web server. And so let's see, does it show the version information? And so yeah, you're looking for the version information. So you see if it's exploited or not. This one is running light HTTP D. Uh, and so this is this is the version. So you can look up on exploit DB if there's any exploits for that. So this goes through there and shows you all this, so different testing for HTTP methods. HTTP methods can be, can be risky, can be dangerous. So like for instance, get and post are good, but your put and deletes are dangerous because a put can allow you to upload files. Anyone that's going through some of these different hacking labs, there may be something on there that like on Windows, if it's using WebDAV, the WebDAV protocol, and it's got puts and deletes enabled. You can upload files to it and you can delete files. Put, you can upload something to get a shell. Deletes are kind of bad because information can be deleted. So, you know, that way an attacker can actually clean up after themselves. You can upload the file. And if they don't want any kind of uh, remnants of their compromise, they can go back and delete it. And so you want to test for these different things and then showing Nmap. Nmap is a good tool, even though uh, you traditionally think of it more for network pen testing. You really want to make sure to test that that network layer, that whole area of the ecosystem or the environment that your application is running in. You want to make sure to, to test that. And so it, it shows you different ways to test these. So you're needing need to know how to test this. You can go through it. So that's what makes it nice. Not only you're testing, it shows ways to test for those, those type of vulnerabilities. And so with the Web Application Hackers Handbook, they also have a methodology there. I think we're going to, let's take a 15 minute break and we'll be back at the top of the hour. And I've actually got an ebook of the Web Application Hackers Handbook and I can bring that up and kind of show you uh, go through their methodology and you can kind of see what their methodology looks like. So be back at the top of the hour. So thanks. So welcome back everyone and thanks Perry for the reminder. <laughs> Appreciate that. Definitely helpful when you have folks helping out in, in these workshops, reminding to record. <laughs> so that's a good thing. Okay. So we mentioned going through and showing the, oh, the uh, testing guide for, for the uh, hackers or the web application hackers handbook. So I just want to pull up the real quick, just the, the methodology that for them real quick. We won't go into much depth of that, but just to kind of show it.
Yeah, I thought I was just going to bring this up in my browser, but uh, since I've viewed this across my different devices, including my phone, it's told me that the license won't allow me to read on another device because I can kind of see people sharing their account with their friends or a bunch of friends. And so that's probably why they do that. So. Someone asked, Pat, is any, anyone use Pentester Academy? I like it. Actually, I used to use, I've used them before for, for uh, workshops that I've taught before I've used their, their labs. So yeah, it was kind of interesting because back when they came out with attack and defense labs, uh, Vivek, the owner actually gave me uh, some, some beta codes for my Pwn School members because for our different virtual meetings. And so she, he was nice enough to, uh, to share beta codes. So yeah, it's it's good stuff, man. They just keep adding stuff. I forget how many thousands of labs that they got now and they're getting into cloud related stuff and containerization. So it's a really good, really good resource and everything's accessible through the guacamole. So you're able to view that online. Without having to use like a VPN to connect. Okay. Now let's see here now if we can. Agree, people. Amazon give me fits. Did they actually even bought the book another time to a, a second occasion to be able to use it. So we're just not going to spend any more time with some of that. Because I'll get a book and I'll read them. I've got like a Kindle, one of the paper white Kindles. And then I have the app on my different computers so I can view the view the, the ebooks. But anyway, any rate, I recommend going through that and looking at that, the methodology there. And one of the things that, that I think having an extra methodology in there is helpful. I did an interview with John John Jackson recently. No, it wasn't John Jackson that I spoke to. It was uh, Tiberius. The Tiberius actually said that one of the things that people forget sometimes is there's vulnerabilities outside the OWASP top 10. So to test for those as well. And, you know, using something like the Web, applica Web Application Hackers Handbook will help with that. And the OWASP testing guide too, I believe a lot of some that may not be in the, the OWASP top 10, but there's items on there that are going to be tested that may not be in the top 10. So we kind of covered our methodologies. And so this is just kind of a uh, quick little overview of a web app pen testing methodology. So your information gathering at OSINT, search engine discovery for information leakage, uh, fingerprinting, uh, oh, you know, the OS web server application frameworks, vulnerability scanning, port, port and service scanning, and testing for OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities, although not limiting it to OWASP top 10. And so some different web application penetration testing tools. You got your, your dynamic application security testing tools or DASTs, also referred to as web application vulnerability scanners. And these test the code in action. So you got your static code analysis, analysis tools your SAS that tests the code statically just in the file uh, with 
the DAST, you're actually testing things running on the web server. And there's things you can find there that you're not going to find in SAST and vice versa. So it's a good idea to do both of those. But most of your pen tests, you're going to be doing um, using a DAST, even using like Burp Suite. When I was getting, when I was starting out uh, in web app pen testing, companies I worked for would use either web inspect or app scan. And then it just got to where there's so many false positives with some of these web app uh, vulnerability scanners that we just started using the, the web app vulnerability scanning feature of Burp Suite. Because what would happen is you find a bunch of these, these uh, vulnerabilities and they're false positives. So you have to go through your going through and ruling out false positives. And that would spend, that would waste a lot of your time. Plus desks can be pretty expensive. I think like NetSparker and Acunetics are probably a little less expensive, but the, uh, once you get into like app scan and web inspect, some of those get kind of expensive. And so also you got your interception proxy, which Burp and Zap are also referred to as interception proxies. That's not all they do. They, they have that as a feature because Peros proxy was one of the first ones that came out. I mean, it may have been an OWASP project, or at least I first learned about that through OWASP. And it's basically an interception proxy intercepts the, intercepts the HTTP traffic and you're able to manipulate it or just basically, you know, kind of basically you're sniffing the traffic, seeing what's going on. And so some of the, they kind of evolved into tools like Zap and Burp Suite where you can tamper and fuzz that information with those interception proxies. So if you're going to, if you're doing pen testing, you're doing bug bounties and you're, you know, if you've been doing this, you know, most people recommend getting a commercial license of uh, Burp Suite, but there are some people that are fine, that are doing well with OWASP Zap. One of the things I recommend too, is you can use the, the uh, Burp Community Edition and then for your vulnerability scanning, you could use OWASP Zap to do that for you. So you got SQL Map, which is also, it's a tool for test, testing for SQL injection you can even get command line access with that because the, the pen test I was mentioned earlier, where I was able to get command line access through a SQL injection vulnerability. I was using SQL map through Burp Suite using this, this plugin called CO2, which allows you to connect and work with in uh, work with SQL map with Burp Suite. So if you find something, you can right click it send it to SQL map and then run scans on it to, to validate and even do things like uh, looking at table information, even getting command line access with it. So there's a lot of different things you can do. And Nikto is a, a command line vulnerability scanner that uh, works pretty well. I've done pen tests before where I was, I run, you know, Nessus vulnerability scanner, Burp Suite, and I didn't find anything, but I ran Nikto and I found stuff with it. So always make sure to use a variety of tools because some of these free stuff that people kind of laugh about, I've got out of anything I've ever mentioned on social media, the tools that I use that I've ever got any kind of negative or was really, I'd say question about is you still use Nikto or use Nikto and you use it enough. You kind of find out I've got people that I mentor and good friends that, you know, have been in pen testing long when they were starting out, you know, I hear them, you know, singing the praises of Nikto because they've used it on pen tests before and you find stuff. It runs pretty quick and it gives you, you know, a lot of information. Otherwise you'd have to do manual techniques like banner grabbing, you know, it performs a lot of these features within there and it's a command line output. So you can kind of quickly scan through things you found and they'll look for default credentials. Cause whenever I did that, uh, the one pen test where I got in through uh, Red Hat JBoss, I was using Nikto. The other vulnerability scanners did not find like the default credentials. Nikto found it and I was able to get in. So you want a variety of tools. So not, not saying that you just rely on Nikto and that's it. You're going to miss stuff, but the more tools you're using, you know, there's going to be some overlap that one of those tools is not going to find something or do a certain uh, function. So having multiple tools is definitely helpful. And so some of the, so, so when you're also doing your web app pen testing, you want to make sure to test the network. So Sometimes this may not be in scope for your pen test, but if you're going to do a pen test, part of that, if you're not doing the network piece, a network pen test needs to be performed. And one of the ways I like to describe that is, okay, 
you could have that application, the web server or the app or the web application server really locked down. But if your infrastructure, if your operating system or other uh, services and applications run on that server are vulnerable, then that may be a way to get in. A, a way to describe that is you think you could get the world's most expensive, best lock, but if you got a really cheap, flimsy door that you put that on, people can still get in. So it's the same thing with with this, you can have your application really secure, but if your your environment that that application is hosted in is not secure, then people are going to get in. I mean, there's many layers to that that you could see. I mean, if you really want to get down to that physical access, which that's on a pen test for applications usually not in scope, but you just have to look at the different ways attackers could get in. So definitely, you want to make sure. And most companies, when they're doing this, they're going to have a network pen test done at some point and then maybe do the application separately. But one of the things I'll do if you know if it's part of a a pen test, a network pen test, then you may not be able to run these. But one of the things too is if if there's anything in scope for any kind of web app services or applications running on that network you're testing, make sure to use the the application features within the application options within Nessus because you'll find stuff there that you're not going to find just doing a normal network scan. Uh, one of the companies I used to work at, one of the, someone was peer reviewing my report and couldn't understand why I was finding all these other vulnerabilities. And it's because I had the web checks turned on and it was finding these other vulnerabilities. If it's not testing for things, it's not going to find it, even though it may be there. And so do I like your, there's different options when it comes to that. Nessus and Nexpose are going to be two of your most popular ones. Uh, your enterprise environments, you're going to see like a, uh, uh, Tenable's Security Center, which is like a their enterprise version of Nessus. And then you also have Qualys. Some companies will use Qualys. Nessus has been pretty popular. Uh, Nexpose is portable as well, but some of these uh, options like Qualys uh, makes it a little more difficult when you're trying to use the cloud to do your scanning and portability. Maybe you have to go in an environment that you can't test otherwise. So at so any rate, that's... Uh, so Nessus has been one of my favorite ones and most consult, every consulting company I've worked for, they've used Nessus. I've seen internal companies use Nexpose. I did a pen test for a customer one time and not to say that uh, Nexpose is not good, but I performed a pen test and I found stuff with Nessus that Nexpose didn't find. And I'm sure that you could do just the opposite. You could probably do pen tests with Nexpose and maybe it'll catch something in Nessus or one of the other ones didn't catch. So, uh, Lola has a question. So can you can you compare OpenVos with Nessus? The interesting thing about OpenVos and Nessus, uh, OpenVos is a fork from Nessus, Nessus, meaning the original code for Nessus. Because at one time you could use Nessus for free and then it became commercial. And so when someone took the, the original code for Nessus and they developed it. So, you know, you've got someone working on this code, two different teams and they split off. And they're, so things are going to be a lot different. Now, OpenVos is not as intuitive and it's a little more uh, less user friendly to use. So I'd say Nessus is going to be more user user friendly, although I've seen companies where their consultants would run Nessus and also run OpenVos to see if they caught, you know, something with an alternative vulnerability scanner. So I'd say ease of use if, you know, it's going to take a little more to learn just because the the logic flow and how OpenVos works, and there's even uh, Greenbone or whoever the the vendor is for that. There's actually even a a uh, professional version of of that tool. Yeah, if you like it, that's good. You know how to use it. But for me, I went from using Nessus to try and use OpenVos because I took some some different courses. I think uh, uh, Virtual Hacking Labs. I think I went through some of their stuff a few years ago, and I was playing around with OpenVos. So just after using Nessus, it's, but like a lot of things, you know, you may find something in OpenVos that Nessus misses and vice versa. Cause you know, sometimes the tool just hasn't been updated at that point or they, their researchers found something, but so it's, and it's good to use different ones. Cause like uh, some third-party ATM pen testers that we used, they would use OpenVos and Nessus both. I never got to see I've never really com compared scans between the two, but I'm just kind of an, a Nessus fan, but OpenVos having something free is good. 
and it's good to learn the different things, but, you know, but one of the things I also like about Nessus is there's a community edition or there, I think they call it uh, Nessus Essentials now. And you can scan like 16 IP addresses and that's enough for a home lab. So, I mean, you could have like a small home lab and do plan scanning. One of the things to keep in mind is the IP addresses may change on your, say if you've got 16 vulnerable VMs on your network and you want a new one, you just take one offline and then, you know, spin up your new one and use the IP so you can change out your vulnerable VMs. So in a real world environment, people aren't going to be doing that with their systems, but, you know, in our labs, we can do what we want to with it. So you can switch that out. So Nessus CE may be what their, what Nessus Essentials was or Nessus Home, because it's changed different, different uh, names, but it's only, it, it's a, uh, limited to 16 IP addresses, but you know, some companies, there are some companies that are small enough that could use that for all their stuff. So we're gonna make sure to test this because what's gonna happen too, and especially like your, your port and service scanners like NMAP and MassScan, sometimes you can uncover unused or abandoned services or applications. So maybe some companies started out with, with IIS for their application, Maybe they decided they wanted to go to a JSP based application. So they went to some Java, you know, server, you know, Java application server like JBoss or, or Tomcat. And sometimes they don't, un, they don't remove the old application. And what happens usually with old applications is they're not being updated. They're not being maintained. And maybe that there, maybe that specific application or function is not being pen tested so it can be vulnerable so sometimes you can come in there may be a way to exploit the system through an unused service so doing like your nmap scans and stuff like that is pretty helpful yeah see pat likes nessus yeah nessus is nice it's hard to hard to want to change i mean because even when i worked for one company as a red team lead they had nexpos but it was the cloud-based setup so it wasn't portable and so i I was able to get a Nessus license. It's just Nessus is, and like I said, you know, most, most consulting companies now, now Rapid7, you know, their pen testers are probably using Nexpos because it's their company's product. But like I said, I've worked for full-time for two consulting companies and then some side stuff for two other consulting companies. So I worked for four different consulting companies that used, that used Nessus. So, but not to say the others are bad. And one of the one of the, the benefits to something like Nexpos, if you've got a uh, Metasploit professional, is with some of, the, some of these professional exploit frameworks, they make it a little easier to automate exploitation compared to just using uh, Metasploit, the Metasploit framework. And so those are things they take in consideration there. And so when you're, you're setting up your attack system, one of the things I've kind of, uh, you know, to, to be more real world, you know, originally when I was doing these workshops, <clears throat> you know, it was, you know, you're going to use, use Kali Linux or whatever, and this, this is what you use. But one of the things I've kind of learned from my experience, you know, use tools you're comfortable with. I would say if you don't know Linux, learn Linux. But if you're doing your web app pen test, then you can run Burp Suite in a Wasp Zap in Windows or Mac OS or other versions of Linux. So use what you're comfortable with. You know, you can learn other tools. You can learn Linux as you, you know, get experience. You know, you can, and one of the things I like to do is when I'm pen testing, I will test in Mac OS. I'm using uh, Burp Suite or Zap there. But some of the other tools that I may not want to install on Mac OS, some of the other hacking tools, I may just leave it on my Kali Linux or Parrot OS, which I use both of those. So at any rate, that's uh, kind of so 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 that's kind of the direction there. So you can set up your your testing laptop for what you want. When I've worked for companies, my first pen test job, our testing laptops were were Macs. So I got used to Mac. You know, Mac is is a Unix based operating system, so it's going to be similar to Linux. So I just really like the command line and the functionality of Linux and Unix machines. So that's why I use it when I test. So when I worked for companies that I didn't have Mac OS then I would take my attack machine 
and I would run Ubuntu as my my host OS, and then I'd run like a VM of Kali Linux, and then like a Windows VM for pen testing tools on on Windows. So I'd run two VMs in that environment. So yeah, like I said, use something you're comfortable with. So some of the different Kali Linux or different operating systems there's Kali Linux most people are familiar with. Parrot OS is really good. I used it last year for a a Wi-Fi pen test, and I really loved it. I really hadn't used it much, but I was running into some problems with some of the Wi-Fi tools uh, working on Kali Linux. So I used Parrot OS, and I had a really good experience with that. So I still use both of those. And if you use it, make sure you get Parrot Security OS. There's another operating system that's not really, doesn't have the pen testing tools. It's just a Linux distribution. So make sure you're getting Security OS. And then you can take Ubuntu and it probably works on Debian. I'm not sure what all I couldn't find. I was looking it up at one time. I know they, I think the recommendation was run on Ubuntu or Debian, which Debian is a, you know, kind of a came out of, uh, Ubuntu came out of Debian. But uh, you may be able to run the Pentester framework on other operating systems, but the Pentester framework was created by Dave Kennedy at Trusted Sec. And so it's a way to install these different pen testing tools uh, on your in your Linux distribution. So that was one of the options I kind of liked to. And you know, I've worked for companies that we uh, have cloud-based testing systems. And you know, they had some Ubuntu systems out there for for the AWS environment. And so we were able to use, you can use like Pentester Framework. And there's also another, yes, yeah, Snap is another install uh, utility that you can use on Ubuntu to install some of the other pen testing tools. But my experience was, with it was on one pen test. And when I was trying to uh, install like Nmap, it really messed up some of the networking functionality for some of the other pen testing tools. So I ended up having to uninstall Snap and then use manually install the pen test tools directly. Samurai Web Testing Framework or Samurai WTF. I really like that acronym. Uh, they use this in the SANS Web App Pen Testing course. So they did. It's been a while since I took it. So if you go out there and download, uh, if you look up Samurai WTF or Web Testing Framework, there's also a PDF out there on a Web App Pen Testing course. And it's pretty close to what uh, the SANS course was. The creator of Samurai WTF also it you know, wrote a PDF course on how to use Samurai WTF. So it's uh, a tool out there you can test with. And just like Mac and Windows, you can use that for, for web app pen testing. Like I said, use something that you're, that you're comfortable with. And then you get up to speed. You know, Linux, you can always learn down the road. So kind of the tax system, I'm just outlining Kali Linux here. This could be uh, Parrot OS too. So you're going to have like a Kali Linux you want you know, the core Kali Linux pen testing tools, which uh, includes like Burp Suite community, and you can install other tools as well. You know, most of the pen testing tools are in the repositories. Same thing with like uh, Parrot OS. And there's other pen testing distributions that came out over the years, but, you know, I'd say Kali Linux and Parrot OS have been really maintained well, and they continue to evolve. And one of the things I like about one thing is like Kali Linux is created by offensive security. So it's created by people that were actually doing pen tests with this, not only their educator, they also have, you know, they also do pen testing services. So a lot of the stuff was built by people that were in pen testing. And so you kind of have that there, just like the, uh, the pen tester framework by Dave Kennedy, a trusted sec, you know, it's created by someone that the pen test. So uh, some of these distributions are kept up pretty well. And so Burp Suite Community Edition is what you're going to want. If you can get, you know, if you're doing bug bounties or something, then you definitely want to look, get the professional version. A Wasp Zap, Arachne is a web app vulnerability scanner. It's free. And you could use that. It's almost, it kind of reminds me of, uh, it's kind of a little bit of different the, the way it works. It almost, it doesn't work like some of the other web app vulnerability scanners, but you can still find stuff with it. I've, I actually rather use OWASP Zap or Burp Suite over that. And then your browsers, it's a good idea to have like Chrome or Chromium based browser in there as well as Firefox. And one of the things I like about Firefox for pen testing 
is, you know, you're, when you're using your proxy tools, uh, a lot of your system proxy stuff, you know, your companies have proxies to control what websites you go to, block certain websites and stuff. And so even like your email system, so if you're trying to run Burp Suite on, uh, on your system, like I was ran to this when I was an internal pen tester for a company uh, that I was trying to use, I was using like Internet Explorer or Chrome. And so I ended up just going over to Firefox for that pen test because it kept bringing in proxy information. So like my Outlook information was coming through and so to cut down that traffic and make sure you're only dealing with traffic that you are trying to test, then using something like Firefox. And then your, your browser plugins, like your proxy switchers. So Foxy Proxy for Firefox is a good one. And what why these are important is you've got to set up the proxy settings within your browser to point it to Zap or Burp Suite. And if you're using multiple tools, and plus, there's times that you don't want to use uh, Burp Suite or Zap and you want to be able to go around it. So with this proxy switching tool, you're able to disable it. You're able to add and quickly switch between like uh, Zap and uh, Burp Suite. And then a user, a user agent switcher. User agents are important because sometimes that can work as, yeah, that's a good point, Michael. That's kind of, that's where competition is good. This was something that Zap had been doing for years. And Burp Suite kind of copied it. And also Burp Suite, like their, their store, the Burp Suite store where you go install the plugins, used to you had to manually download and install the plugins, but they got the idea of the app store from, from Zap. So that's where, where uh, competition helps tools. And so like the user agent switcher back to that, there's sometimes there's some bypasses that you can use even for Network access control. This is one of the things I did learn from the from the SANS web app pen testing course that I that I had ran across at the time. And using that that user switcher agent, some companies their network access control uh, systems will block certain devices. So if you change your user agent to look like a mobile device, then you may be able to bypass the NAC. Same thing with some applications. Maybe the application is written. Uh, they had to change something for you to be able to, to access this application on a mobile device. And so sometimes if you access the application as a mobile user, you may be able to get the things you couldn't get to as a browser-based user, normal browser-based user. So yeah, that's good. And, and the, it's nice they do that. The heads-up display is one thing that I'd be curious to see that if Burp Suite comes out with because the the heads up display on a WASP zap is pretty cool because in your browser, you've got buttons where you can start a scan. You can see different types of vulnerabilities within the browser. So you navigate to a certain page because if you're using zap the old way or using burp suite, you know, you may see vulnerabilities in certain pages, but trying to get to certain content may be tricky. Whereas with the heads up display, you're actually working through the application as you go. So it's more of a natural have more of a natural feel to things. Let's take a look at the comments here. Yeah, it's kind of funny some of the different names that they've come out with the some of the different browsers and on um, Burp Suite. And I guess they, I mean, not Burp Suite, but Kali Linux. And I think they're out there just like there used to be the Ice Weasel browser. I think it was like a fork or a, a it's a Firefox like browser. I don't know that it's an option anymore, but that was kind of funny, the name there. But one of the things with the, yeah. Well, that Firefox ESR, that's like one of the developer type, which that's good. And that's usually what I, I like to use for pen testing. I usually like to use the Firefox ESR instead of just plain Firefox. And there's some, some different, there's a lot of different cool plugins that, in, you know, there's more that you can get into that. And, and, and for this, for this uh, workshop, I, several years ago, when I first did this workshop, I ran across this pen test lab script and you can actually see it here. And I'm going to go ahead and pop it up in chat so you can download it. And when I was first developing this, this workshop, the thing I wanted to make it as easy for people to set up. I used to create a VM 
where people could download, but then the thing you run into that with that, you're having to constantly update the VM and upload it again. And then, you know, sometimes people can download, you know, if they already got Kali Linux in their environment already that they can just put this on there. So this script, tell you what I need to step away for just a second, but I'll be right back. So yeah, when I was building that that lab, you know, just keeping up with the VM was kind of a a, a big overhead and headache. And so I just figured we'd do it this way. That way, you know, people get experience from building out their test environments too. And for anyone that's using uh, that is is using the new Mac M1, one of the things I've found that is, is good for virtualization on the Mac M1 is Parallels was one of the first ones to come out with a with an, uh, a virtualization software that would run on the Mac M1 because I was using VirtualBox before in the past, VirtualBox, and also uh, VMware Fusion. And so when I got my new Macs and totally went all in on the M1, because I got a Mac mini and a MacBook Pro, when I went that route, then it's trying to get virtualization to work. And so that's where also it takes a little more work to send this up because you have to download, I'd have to go back and see now, but I know just not long ago, you had to download ISOs to build stuff for uh, to run on a Mac because they have like an, an ISO that you can download for ARM64 for Kali Linux. So you run into some things there and then your lab, some of your VMs, if you're going to try to download some VMs, then that can be kind of a, a pain. And so that's one of the things that if you have a Mac M1 or any other device, it's kind of a good idea in your home lab to have some server that you can put a bunch of VMs on. So that way, you know, you can kind of, that makes things easier. And that's kind of what I have to do in my environment, use something online or build VMs on my, my server at home. And so with this, uh, with this script I shared with you, it's able to set where if you go back and look, these are all the different applications that, that runs on here. And so you've got all the major applications, buggy web app, the web goat series, damn vulnerable web app, Matilda Day 2, OWASP juice shop, which is a really good one. WP scan vulnerable web press. This is good because you can use the WP scan tool because WP scan is a really good vulnerability scanner for uh, WordPress vulnerabilities. So you can test that on there. So all these different apps, they're Docker based uh, apps and you can run all those on there. So you got all these 10 different applications that you can test. And the nice thing about this app too is that uh,
So the nice thing is that you're, it creates like a host name for all your, your applications. So it creates the host, host name as well as a unique IP address. So this makes, you can have several applications running at once and say like, if you wanted to run a scan against multiple IP addresses, then you can do that. So that kind of makes it nice. Uh, when I was building, originally building that VM and ran across this script, I saw that someone had built a environment for, for learning and they installed the, you know, they, on their attack box, you've got your lab in there too. So you don't have to worry about VMs be able to connect. Everything is on the same box. It's not taking up too much disk space because you've got Linux running once and you, you, you know, your memory resources you can use on that. So that made it nice because I knew at a workshop, you could have everyone with the same identical computer, same operating system version and all that, same virtualization, but something is not going to work the same on other computers. So I thought if you could put everything in this one operating system, the target you're attacking and all that, that'll make it easier. And so to install this, we just need to do so you just get cloned in here. Yeah, let's see. And then we just see change directories to Intel Slab. And so we start this the first time. So we already have. Uh, Docker install, but I'm going to run this just in case there was something that maybe got missed. Okay, so Docker's already in it, so it doesn't do anything special there. So if you didn't have Docker installed, you have to have Docker installed. And so we're going to run Pentester Lab, Pentest Lab. And it helps when you spell stuff right. And that's kind of why I like, okay, so it's not. Well, let's go ahead and make sure something's kind of funky with our. Did for the internet. So I don't know if they have we'll see if it installed correctly. That's the one thing the beauties about Linux Docker was not found. I don't know what that looks going to see if it works under sudo. Okay. So it shouldn't be that difficult to get set up, but once you get Docker installed, if you type in that script, it'll give you the name of the you can look at the list of all the different applications on there. You can start and stop and get like a status on it. It may be something because I was using another lab the other day. I'm going to go ahead and restart this real quick. So if you're following along, then you should be able to get that installed. And it's another thing nice with parallels. There's some images up there already that you can download because download, because I actually, I guess, I think I pulled that from their app store or something. Install that. Let's see if it'll install this time. Hmm. 
Okay, for some reason it's not getting to one of the one of the resources on there. So we're not going to mess with doing an app kit update because we're just kind of getting down to the end of the workshop. But basically you install this in there. If you look at the website, they give you pretty good instructions on on what all to, to do to start it. Pretty easy to start up and use. So here you can see you get clone. And so when you start it, if we want to start buggy web app, then you're just going to use the script, start buggy web app. And then it's going to give you the, the, uh, this URL creates domain names for each one of these. So you're able to connect there and also give you an IP address. So you can change like the ports and stuff if you want to, but it'll, if you, it gives like a unique port to each one of these. So you can run, I don't know, maybe some case, yeah, that gives a unique IP address. So uh, you can see here, it's giving like a 192 dot address. So this is, uh, actually, I guess this is setting up specific. It gives you like a 127.0.2 or something like that. But at any rate, it's a, it's a nice little app. You can run as many of the, the different applications at one time if you want to. Some of the things are kind of limited to some of the vulnerabilities like juice shop is kind of limited to some of the things you can do there. You can still, what will happen is like your SQL injection kind of stuff, you're kind of limited what you can do there. Since it's local running on your machine, they're trying to prevent vulnerabilities on your system. Another thing you can do too, which I really love doing as well with setting up a lab is with all these other external resources and cloud-based stuff, for instance, uh, So Heroku is a is Salesforce their cloud, so you can actually install like Juice Shop on Heroku, so it's actually hosted online. So there's there should be there should be like a a, a lab on there. So here's an instance that you can go on access to, but you can actually install your own. You can actually go online and use that if you want to. Yeah, I will send out the, the labs to the workshop for the workshop. And so there's a lot, there's some other ones out there too that you can test online. I kind of like those because in my web app pen testing class, part of the assignment was a pen test. So the students had to perform a pen testing class. And so I the for the pen test, I had there was some different vulnerable apps that are online because some of the different vulnerability scanning companies will create their own online uh, applications for you to, to uh, play around with to test the scanner. Just like one of them's like Hackazon is one of them. And then try Hack Me. I mean, that's a really good place to start too. I really, if you're really wanting to, to learn web app pen testing, try Hack Me would be where I would start because there's some other resources out there that are good and I'll cover those, but uh, but it's more educational. Some of these other ones like Pentester Lab, uh, it's good, but you it, it's really, the more you know going into it, the more you get out of it. So this hack is on. This is one of the ones I have my students do a pen test. It looks like an online e-commerce site. So good. And so, Let's go back to the resources. So also another one that came out that if I'd known about this sooner, I probably use it. And this is Websploit. It's by Omar Santos. He's one of the, he's a co-founder of the Red Team Village, as well as Texas Cyber Summit, uh, Gray Hat, and uh, the Mayhem Fest, the different things that they put on. But this one is a, is a site you can download. I mean, you can go to the site and download and it's actually an application similar to this Pentester Lab 
that you download and you install these scripts that runs on Docker and and also the thing about Omar, he does he does training for uh, for O'Reilly Books, and it's kind of funny because for my ethical hacking class is based on the pen test plus, and the first the first time I started using the content, it's on you certify, and the book they use it is based on Omar's book. So I'm reading through the slides, and it says Omar Santos to say, hey, I know that guy, but Omar is super super smart guy. He works for Cisco. And he's got this project. Here's the apps that they've got running on there. And so this one, I think, is custom that they wrote. So like Mayhem, Gray Hat, Hack Me Dash. So this is like Red Team Village for, for the Red Team Village. So these are some things that they, so Hack is on. They actually have Hack is on there. Like I showed you, there's a, they've got that on there. But like the Gray Hat Mayhem, RTV Safe Mode, and some of those are some ones that they actually built for these different conferences in like Red Hat, I mean, Black Hat, I mean, DEF CON in the Red Team Village and stuff. So this is a good one. Really smart guy. It's interesting to see the stuff he, that, that, he, that he does. I mean, it's just like, the guy's really, really a smart and talented person. So that's, that's a good resource there. Like I said, it's kind of going to work similar to your, to the Pentester Lab. And just kind of some of their learning resources here, because we're getting pretty close to the, to the top of the hour and end of the, the workshop. Uh, this one, the Web Application Hackers Handbook, even though uh, Port Swigger Web Security Academy, the, their Web Security Academy is out there, this one's nice because they give you the methodology and it's a good reference. I mean, it's a thick book, but you really want to learn web application pen testing thoroughly. That's a good book to use. Web Security Academy by Portswigger, instead of updating the Web Application Hackers Handbook, they put online along with labs. And so I'm gonna go ahead and pop some of these links up in there as we go, because I'm gonna send out slides, but at least that way you've got these URLs if you want them immediately. Then you got Bug Crowd University. They're trying to educate people to do bug bounty. So Bug Crowd University is a good one. They've got a lot of good videos out there and some other content. Hacker One has Hacker 101. And so this is like an online kind of CTF and educational site. So they take you through learning web app pen tests so you can perform on their bug bounties. And so also here for the OWASP testing guide and OWASP top 10, you can find by going to OWASP.org but here is the testing guide so you can find that. They update it and change the link sometimes so it can be, so that's the latest and greatest there. So the OWASP top 10, going through there, understanding those vulnerabilities will help you on a web app pen test because every time, anytime you go through a pen test interview, they're going to ask you questions on the OWASP top 10 and it may not necessarily, you know, be doing, it may not be a, a job focused on web app pen testing, but they're going to ask you about SQL injection, cross-site scripting. So knowing the different types of cross-site scripting and be able to explain that's helpful. And, and just going through, you get to learn the risks of the OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities. So it's very educational. Uh, SANS pen test blog has some good information on pen testing in general. And then hackingtutorials.org, they've got some free content on there for learning. And then some of these resources here, these are, 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 are paid resources. Some of these have some free content, uh, like INE has their EJPT course, which is totally free. SANS, their blogs, they'll give you for free. They do some, some webinars and stuff, but not so much in learning content. Offensive security, most of their content, they have their advanced or the AWAE course, which certifies you for the, the OSWE course OS yeah the OS WE but it gets more into uh, static code analysis so you really need to do something before you even take that class and uh, so INE as far as paid content the web app pen testing course is a good one to start with I took that course in the mobile pen testing course when it was e-learn security when I was starting out so when I was starting out there, I, 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 I did those courses because I went, it was going into a dedicated web app pen testing role and doing mobile pen testing. So I took those two courses there. 
Uh, Pentester Academy has some really good stuff, really great labs, some different classes. And, and Pentester Lab, not to be confused with the Pentest Lab script, uh, this one here is uh, out of any of the education content, they'll show you how to get a, a shell if you can get one. They show you that. And so they've got a lot of, they've got some free content on here as well. Try Hack Me does this too, does well as too. But if you're going to start out, I would recommend starting out with, with Try Hack Me, go through the educational content and then kind of go back in to the, the Web, Academy, Web Security Academy through Port Swigger after you build up a little bit of that base knowledge. Because, you know, with the, the Try Hack Me, they've got like a section where they're actually even using Juice Shop. And I just really like the way they do their, their, their content on there because they'll even have things where you're going through and you have to perform an in-map scan or run a certain tool to get the output to answer the questions. So it's really a good way to make, to make their labs and stuff hands-on and you can learn as you go. But as far as web app pen testing, start with Try Hack Me. And then you can get into some of these other, other learning resources and learn from those. And here is my contact information. And also have my, my podcast, The Hacker Factory on ITSP Magazine that you can check out. But feel free to reach out to me because I, you know, mentoring is how I got into teaching and just sharing resources was kind of how I got me, got me interested in, in teaching. And so uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to answer questions. You know, I've helped people get started. I mean, uh, Lola and, and Michael here, Sis, Sis Meltdown, they can tell you they've, we've interacted a lot. I've known them for a while and, you know, I'm always happy to, to help people out. And there's a link to my podcast. So we're up to like 10, I believe 10 episodes now, 10 or 11 episodes. So the thing about the Hacker Factory podcast is, uh, I bring on different people that are either hobbyists, you know, they may do CTFs, someone that works as a red teamer and different things. So uh, it's really good because people share their stories. And I have one of a podcast where with a reformed uh, hacktivist that was very interesting. I mean, I've had Lily from i &E on there. I've had Joe Helley, the mayor on there. I've had IPSEC. A lot of good guests on there and i've got some more that are coming up uh davin jackson some more to come too you know i had someone that i recorded yesterday that i'm just kind of make it keep it a secret but it's when it comes out it's going to be a really good one so one of my favorite one of my favorite hackers and one of the best hackers in the industry in my opinion because they're really hacking some really complex stuff So that pretty much concludes the, the workshop. So if anyone has any questions, let me know. And the whole purpose of the, you know, too, is having that lab set up and learning this stuff. Like I said, get started that try hack me, you know, the, the two scripts that I showed you where you could download the vulnerable applications on your system. Those are good too. Uh, so yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone for attending and, Thanks to Don for helping. And I appreciate uh, Michael that you were steering people to the right place on Discord. When you have when you have people like friends like Cyber Lola and and, uh, and Michael, it's kind of like you have teacher teaching assistants everywhere you go. So <laughs> so yeah, thanks for attending everyone. Please feel free. If you have any questions, reach out to me. Uh, I am constantly watch my DMs on Twitter and LinkedIn. Sometimes the weekend is kind of slow, but I rarely really unplug. So a lot of times I will usually answer your questions on the weekend. Sometimes I'm a little slower to do that, but I do answer my DMs. Yes, I will uh, save the, I'll put up a link to the, the workshop video as well as the slides. I'll, I'll share a link out to that, so.